I want to talk about file naming conventions. And I know I've talked with some of you individually about this, but I kind of wanted to go over it. I will make a dedicated training that's just this, and maybe I'll make a fancier slide presentation that includes pictures of donkeys wearing hats and whatnot. Um, but not for today, uh, but this will serve as a recording that you can also reference back to. So I've made these slides really so you can just have the things that I'm going to talk about uh, in a, a textual thing. So um, file naming convention, what we're talking about specifically is the names of the files for the files you'll be generating as you digitize things. So in some ways, this is part of the digitization process. Uh, and file naming is about naming those files that you're creating, whether using a scanner or, you know, if you're taking photos, however you're doing it, you're going to want a file naming convention to keep actually yourself organized. So for clarity, the archive itself, the archival tool, uh, Creative Access is not going to care what your file name is. It just wants you to have a unique file name for every item. And it's going to compare that file name to your metadata spreadsheets if you're where bulk uploading, or you'll just upload a file if you're manually uploading into the archive, but it doesn't care what that file name is. File name conventions are really for you, uh, anticipating that you're gonna wanna organize all of your image files, whether, you know, TIFFs basically, the TIFFs that we talk about all the time or whatever they happen to be. And you're gonna wanna organize them because you're gonna want yourself to have a way to keep track of them. This will also be very helpful as you're working with your spreadsheets, but really in some ways this is for you. And one of the things that we um, noticed, which is a very human kind of thing to do, is a thing where uh, the tendency for most people is to believe that they need to rename all their image files and make them descriptive. And that's actually, although it makes sense, that's actually the opposite of what's a good thing to do because file names don't need to be descriptive, especially for the archive. It doesn't care. It doesn't care how it's described, but descriptive file names tend to not organize very well when you're trying to organize them in your own files and stuff like that. So, uh, kind of what we're talking about is that file names can actually be very abstract, but you can build into that abstraction a lot of meaning for yourself, depending on how you think, how you're organizing your files, and how you want these things to be. So what you should be seeing on the screen now are just two examples that I just made up, right? And so these are kind of examples of what you can do with file naming, and we'll talk a little bit about the different parts of this, right? So really what you're trying to do is create consistent building blocks for whatever your collections are and whatever they are. And you may have many, right? As ideally as a community archivist, you might be talking to seven people and those seven people might have 10 collections because some of them might have like a family collection and a collection for an organization they're working with or something. And you're working with these things. It's up to you and them to decide what these collections are, but all this organization. So what we're talking about is taking your organization of all the materials you're working with and figuring out how to also translate that organization to something that makes sense to your file names, right? So for example, what you see here is, uh, say for say you're working on even multiple projects, some of them are Menino's projects, some are not. That may be the case. So, you know, a good thing might be is every single file that you would be working with for the Manitos project, you would start with MP for Manitos project. And partly a lot of what this does then, actually also when you have something that basic as your build, your first building block is, it's gonna automatically organize files for you. If you did that little sort files and brought it all up, everything MP is gonna be together. And then the second, the second building block, which in this case might be Cero in my example, will also start to appear together and it'll start to, hierarchalize itself automatically based on, so that's kind of what you, the basics of what you want to do with these file names. So for, and so there's a couple of rules and um, actually there's probably a lot of rules and guidelines, but we're going to do it very simply, right? There's a, uh, NARA actually has, I think it's nine pages about meta, about file naming standards. And a lot of theirs have to do with the fact that they're actually looking at it in this like three-dimensional chess way where even your file name is part of a larger file path, which some of you may recognize from when you do searches in your files. So that file path is where it's like desktop, 
boom, like, you know, puppy file. And then inside the puppy file is another folder, like, you know, my favorite puppy. And then like the actual image files, that's the whole file. There, that's the whole, what's, uh, I don't know what it's called, Katie, the, the whole file flow that I, I knew it like an hour ago and then I forgot. Um, but so they look at that and they go like, that has to be a maximum of 255 characters. So what you're doing is you wanna be a little concise and you want to make your files be as short as you can, but still be useful for, the, for your organization because you don't know, anticipate that maybe in the future, your files might be part of something else and they need to fit in with these in these standards. So to that end also, you don't want to basically use anything other than underscores as any kind of special character in your file names because your computer might recognize asterisks and hyphens and dollar signs, but some other computer on which your files might end up in the future may not. So you wanna leave everything out except pretty much underscore, which is the, the universal one, right? I, I think maybe hyphen is too, but just forget hyphen because it might not be underscore, just stick with underscore. So how you see in my examples is a lot of different ways you can do it. I, I leave out underscores, I just don't care. Like I tend to separate using capital letters as my own weird way. And these are things that you can decide on your own for what makes sense to you, but try to think of these building blocks as a thing. So to get back to my building blocks, as you can see, I would have Manito's project, I would say I'm doing a project in Cero. So I, I'm like, communities are really important in many of those projects. So I'm gonna make the community a very important building block. Then, oh, I'm doing it for the Flotus family, my, my family, so it's the Flotus family. And as you can see, that can be a basic building block on my lower example. But say I was working on multiple projects with, say I'm the subject and, and somebody else is doing this. I may have my family photos, but I also might have a mutualist society I'm either interested in or I have the records for and I'm working with. So I may want to add extra elements like mutualista that starts to help you break out and define your different collections. And then very often a common file naming convention is to date it somehow. Now this dating to me is tricky because often people are using that as the date of digitization. So I'm trying to do it as the date that the photos were created, like there's a lot of way, different ways people use dates. So I would say if you use dates, just uh, be very clear. So now I'm gonna move away from my examples because I'm gonna talk about a few things that about this that I probably already talked about, but I want you to have some notes to do this, right? So um, I think I flipped these slides, but it doesn't matter anyway. So when it comes to uploading, right? you wanna make sure that these names that you're creating, so these file name conventions that you're creating are gonna be really consistent and that they're gonna match the ones that are on your metadata spreadsheet because this is what's going to allow your files to work in the archive, right? So A, the consistency also helps you uh, with your organization. If every single file in your, a particular collection has the exact same components in the metadata name, you're gonna be able to find them all together even if you don't know where that file is, right? That they're in, you can find them all and they'll all be together in a search. But when it comes to the metadata spreadsheet, this is also really helpful for how you organize because you're gonna probably wanna do them all together in a spreadsheet together like that. So it's very helpful. And you really wanna make sure that they're accurate, right? Um, don't duplicate file names, it seems obvious, but I'm gonna say it out loud anyway because that'll obviously confuse the computer system and it will confuse your organization as well. Um, another good tip to have, which is important for your own organization when you're organizing your files, is A, we should always all file the three backup rule, which is you have two backups and then another backup offsite in case your house burns down, right? Like that's just the convention, we all don't really do that, but hopefully you have at least one backup. It's very important when backing up with something, say like Carbon Copy Cloner or some of the programs that are there to backup, that you your backups are identical to whatever it is your file that you actually work with on, and it's good to practice that kind of digital hygiene. Um, so uh, like I said, I, I switched these slides by accident, but so that's kind of about that about this with some kind of 
good file practices once you've created your files. Um, oh, I wanna make one more point about this. Um, I'm just gonna go back a slide just for a second. As you can see, my file naming conventions here just kind of end where they end. As you might always know and recognize, they're gonna end with like a dot and then like a JPEG or TIFF or whatever the file name is, right? Or whatever the file thing is. When working with a scanner, or really any other device that's probably going to digitize. And those of you who have had training on the scanner that we tend to have will know this is, this is the thing you set up in, and they have different names for it, but it's file name conventions that you can set up your prefix for the files that you're about to digitize. And this was what you would put in there. You don't need to add, unless you're doing it manually and, you know, uh, heaven help you if you're having to do this manually and you're going through 100 photos and doing this one by one, that digitization thing will automatically create. So for in this example, after family, will create 001 for a scan, dot TIF, and then the next one will be 002. So you don't have to do that unless you're doing it manually. If you are using a file name convention with a scanner or some other digitization thing, it should advance that number for you. And they always have this uh, ability to, or I shouldn't say always, but most of the time they should have the ability, if you go away from digitizing a particular set of things and you go back, you just re-enter your file name convention, and then you figure out what the last number was, and you could usually enter in the next number so that you have a consistent thing. You don't want to start over again and have two different files that both have a MP0 Flores family 001, because then you're going to create a lot of problems. So always be sure to keep track of where you've left on and left off. So um, now I'm going to jump out to the slide that should have been before the other one, um, or maybe not. I guess it doesn't matter. Um, so to kind of recap a few of the things and have them written out here that I've said already, you know, it's very important that this makes sense to you, right? That MP, like that thing that made sense to me, different ideas might make more sense to you. You may not want to do this by village. You may want to put family first because you're. It's, it's the way that you think, but you want to kind of really follow that idea of what you're doing with these little blocks of data and why you're including them and really make them count because you want to be very concise. So pick four or five data points and follow them and use them consistently for all your collections. This will help you a lot, right? Um, it also is really important that they kind of make sense to someone else in the future. Like think ahead, you may think you're the only one that cares and likes this, but for all you know, you're going to like donate these to somebody later and they're, somebody's going to open them up and be like, I really want to deal with these, but I want to understand what I'm looking at, right? So um, think ahead and think in the long view as you're creating these file naming structures. Also, don't trust your memory, right? Like uh, you're, it's going to make sense to you today. It might even make sense to you a week from now, but at least for me anyway, I look at things from a year ago and I'm like, I have no idea. I don't think that's even the person. I don't even have a memory of whatever was that thing it was. And that happens to me all the time. So hopefully it doesn't happen to you, but it happens to me. So don't trust your memory. So to that end, right, a really important part of this is to keep a legend for all your file naming structures, right? Write down what all those things mean. Write down, even though you think you're going to remember that MP means Menitos Project, right? And a, a good practice to have is, so keep them somewhere, write them down by longhand and tape them under the weird little drawer on your desk that nobody uses that flat thing. Uh, uh, or, or more germanely and importantly, or, you know, stick them in a safe or whatever you're going to do, you know, put them in a thing around your cat's neck or whatever. Um, but a really more sensible thing to them to do from all those things is put them in a readme file and keep them in multiple places, your computer, update them. And whenever appropriate, or you think it's can say you have a big file, just put your file name and conventions as a readme file in every image file that you have, right? That way, somebody comes across that file, that file gets sent off into the world and it arrives somewhere, somebody can open up your readme file and kind of understand what it was you were thinking about when you created these, these uh, components to your file naming structure. Um, and then again, consistency and file naming will really help you. They all can automatically organize your files for you. You're gonna have things in, in the same place and they're going to follow the same rules and across projects, you'll just have something that makes sense to you. So 
that's pretty much everything I wanted to say about file naming and file naming structures for these files. Um, so does anybody have any questions? And there's like a chat thing. I don't know, that might just be somebody saying hi, but let me see what it is. Um, yeah. Well, Katie put in a nice thing, which is a, a good acronym. Lots of copies keep stuff safe, which is a good thing. So, so yeah, so, so no questions then. Well, that's, I think that's good. I, I hope that's a good thing that nobody has questions. So again, this, uh, this presentation will be up later in case you want to refer back to it. And then I'll probably create a special training about file naming structures. So, um, so yeah, does anybody have any experiences they want to share about this in particular or anything, since this is a Platica after all? Um, Shane, if other people are thinking yeah. about things and maybe thinking about what they'd like to say, I, I, I will just chime in on a couple of items. First of all, excellent, excellent advice in this, <laughs> in this slideshow. Really good advice, good things to keep in mind. Um, consistency is key. Um, and just like Shane was saying, you know, creating those sort of root file names that you can then build off of is good. You don't want file names that are like ginormous, um, that are too long. Um, I would, a couple of things I, I was jotting down notes while I was going along. Um, if you have already physically arranged your your collection, because I know it's at one point we we've, we've talked about this, you know, that maybe you're not to the point of digitizing your materials yet, but you've been sort of sorting them physically. If you have that kind of, of setup already for your physical stuff, you can mirror that in the way that your files are organized and named so that it's much easier to find something that you're looking for from one collection to the next. Um, you know, so like if you have, oh, all of these photographs are from our Matanza, for example, if I was doing something here at Highlands, you know, um, here are all the photos from Matanza. Okay, and then when I digitize them, I will create um, a, a naming scheme that mirrors that naming scheme that I've used for my physical collection. Um, you know, so I would probably do, since we've had several Matanzas, I would do the Matanza underscore and then the year underscore and then maybe, uh, you know, if it's a photograph of Shane out <laughs> um, working uh, working the, the Orno, I would put maybe Orno or something like that. Um, so just, it can, that can really be helpful if you already have sort of, a, of a, some kind of scheme in place already for your arrangements that it can be mirrored in your in the way that you organize your digital materials. I would also note too that you know a lot of times we think about these um, files in association with materials that we're digitizing, right? This is my fam these are my family photos that I'm digitizing. But you also want to keep that in mind for digital born materials. So photographs that you took with your digital camera. You know, like if you take photographs with your digital camera and then you go to download them, you'll find that most of them, like mine, mine has a D, I think it's D-S-C-N is the prefix, which means something to my camera, and then just a string of numbers. That means nothing to me, right? So you'll want to, even if you know the material is digital born, you'll want to make sure that you are renaming that in a way, following a lot of these suggestions that Shane is giving you, in a way that you can then find what you're looking for. And you're not just dealing with files that have file names that are a random string of numbers and letters, because that's not gonna be helpful to you at all with finding what you're looking for. Um, Shane did mention not putting um, spaces in your file name, which is really, really important because there are still some um, softwares that can't read that, like they can't read spaces. And so it will, you know, it'll mess up the way that they, um, whether or not they can open your files. I would also note as well, you don't want to use special characters either. I'm not sure if you mentioned that, Shane, because that was like, forever ago, right? <laughs> what is time anymore? I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> so re when, you're, when you're creating your file names, you only want to use letters and numbers. So don't use dollar signs. Definitely don't use ats because we all know what an at means now, right? It's part of our email addresses now. So yeah, when you're doing that, don't use blank spaces and don't use um, any kind of special characters. If you really don't like underscores, 
Um, hyphens, some people also use hyphens between words. That, that will work as well. I use underscores. I should just find it's kind of easier for my eye to read, total preference. Um, the README file, oh, Shane, that is such a great idea. Yes, yes, the README file is really, really important. Um, and this, this is probably getting a little too much inside baseball, but a lot of times a README file is saved as a text file, which is .txt, txt, a text file. Um, most of us work in Word, but Word is proprietary software. So if you save something as a Word document, you have to have Word to open it. So if you're like using a Mac and using some other kind of word processing um, software, you're not going to be able to open um, a doc. So a lot of times, if, and if you open up something like Notepad, almost every computer has Notepad on it. Those are those very basic stripped down note taking applications. And that almost always saves as a text file, a TXT file. And that is, that's sort of a tenant of, of digital preservation. That is, that is a better format for digit, long-term digital preservation than a Word document. Even though Word is ubiquitous, you know, most of us use Word, but not all of us. So um, just some things to keep in mind, some of the things that I thought about. Well, cool. thank you. I, I want to build off a thing you said, because you did remind me of this, actually a couple of things, and I hope I remember them all, which is, um, so you remind me, and I didn't say it at the beginning, but I do want to say it's clear, like, this practice is a really good thing to do before you start digitizing, right? Ideally, you've organized your files, either your own or working with somebody else, so that you know you do have, like, maybe you're going to look at it and realize, oh yeah, I've got three years of Matanzas to use Katie's example. Okay, my file naming convention better reflect that. Oh, now I need to know I need to include a year and I have three years, so good. Three, these years I'm gonna build into this thing. Um, one thing that is a thing too that came out of the example, but I think it's a good illustrative thing, which is again, these file name conventions are abstract and exercise some discipline in just how granular you're gonna go with the data, right? Using again Katie's example, you know, MP Manitos Project, Highlands, Matanza 2017, that's good enough. The fact that it's a picture of me, the fact that it's uh, a, a description of what's happening in there, you don't need to put these in your file naming conventions. All that will be found in your metadata, in your descriptions, in your titles. So Feel free, exercise and discipline going, oh, this is all I really need for a file name. I'm going to stop there because the actual subject of this photo, none of that's really very relevant to a file naming convention. There's other places in the metadata for you to put that information. And that's a good way to keep track of what that is. And thanks, Katie, for pointing out the text file thing, because that is totally important for readmes. And so with every computer has some weird primitive text thing. Just figure out what yours is. Um, I don't even know what mine's called. I just think of it as that text file thing that makes text files. So I have no idea what the actual program's called. Um, I wanted to answer um, Ellen's question, or sort of answer it, because I don't know if we have a complete answer. Um, so that will probably depend on some of the settings, Ellen, for the program. I've seen it both ways, both in Omika and in, in, in uh, uh, um, Collective Access and things like that, where sometimes that file name, because by necessity it has to be as preserved in what's truly, truly the back end, which is like the hard data files that only the computer looks at. I've seen it also where sometimes it's part of the metadata essentially, and so the, that the program automatically preserves that original file name and includes it in the metadata that it displays, either both for the administrative layer where people are entering stuff, and I've even seen it where it for some reason appears in the end user stuff so that for some reason they see the file name, which has always been like, why is that there? Nobody cares. They don't have to care about that because they're looking at it directly. But so I think it's depending on settings sort of thing. Um, I would. I don't know the answer to your second question about accents. I would tend to say that those are inclusive in the special characters that we want to avoid. So I myself, and I see Katie nodding her head, is accent marks is just you leave them out of metadata, or I mean out of file naming conventions because they could cause problems. Like maybe not on your computer, but on somebody else. So 
Uh, thanks for those questions. Those are really good. So thank you, because I think that that was, uh, those are good things to that I didn't think about before we started thinking about this. So I'm, I'm really glad we're doing this. So if anybody has any other, any other, so Andres just confirmed in the chat, his, he's tried accents and they don't transfer over. So uh, they are definitely a special character that would cause problems. So I'm just going to have to stick with the, the boring letters. Um, so uh, does anybody else have any thoughts about this? Like, like, you know, like Andres is so, oh, okay. Um, um, yeah. I, I know that, that sometimes, sometimes it can read an underscore and not a dash. I, yep. I know, you know, when things, and so that's always, that's why I don't like to use underscores because maybe sometimes I forget and put a dash and it doesn't get read. So I really liked your idea, Shane, of I do the same thing. I separate mine with a capital, capital letter. Yeah, smash it all together. It seems to work. So I'm glad it works for somebody else as well and not just me. So I, and I agree with you and I, I almost debated not even mentioning dashes, but for some reason it did, but like, cause an underscore is definitely really the only truly safe character at all. So I, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not glad, but it's good to hear that there is people who have had issues with the dashes cause it sort of, uh, sort of does do that. Um, so, so, so yeah, yes, indeed. Um, yeah, anybody else experiences or anything that they wanted, uh, any good ideas that you guys have for how you're working with the file naming structures? Nope, okay, all right, so moving on, yeah. I, I, have yeah. A, I have a couple of other pieces of advice if people yeah. wanna hear them before you know, we, we move on. Yeah. And, and that has to do with numbers. Um, so if you do add dates to your file name, uh, beyond just the year. What you might want to do is, um, and I'm going to put it in the chat here, there's an international standard for numbers, um, and you guys have all seen it before. It's the year, 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 month, month, day, day. That's sort of a standard for how to insert dates and how to date um, materials um, in your metadata and things like that, because it then is sortable. Right. So so it's automatically if you sort your your files and they all have the same root name, except they have a date, a diff, different date at the end, it will then sort them chronologically and it's going to sort by date and then month and then or date and then month and then no, year and then month and then date. Sorry. Woo! Backwards. Um, so just so that you know that that is um, a standard and it makes it really easy to sort your materials and then on the back end it's also um, easier for some systems to read because it is an, um, a standard an international standard number out of Sweden, Switzerland, Swi the Swiss are great with <laughs> standards number standards. Um, and the other thing that I um, would advise, again, if you are using numbers not that are not necessarily dates, you may want to always use the same number of digits. For example, if I am, if I am numbering something from 1 to 150, if you have that many photographs from the Matanza, for example, um, you want to start your number one with zero, zero, one, right? And then when you get to the teens, it's, you know, 17 is going to be zero, one, seven. Because if you just use the number, it's going to put one and then 10 and then 11 and then 12. Um, do you see what I'm saying? It's going to, it's not going to sort them correctly by numbers. It's going to take whatever comes after one next if that makes sense. Does that, do you guys see what I'm saying? I, I saw somebody nod their head, so they were following, <laughs> following me. So like- um, that That's exactly dates and numbers is how we do accession numbers I, I, in yeah. the museum. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Katie. I, I never use less than four because I, assume that something's gonna happen in the future. Um, and so, and, and so also just, you know, to point out in regards to things like the scanners and stuff, this is actually a setting you get to set, right? So if you're lucky to be doing a scanner and not doing it by hand, it'll do this numbering for you. You can actually set the number of characters 
that you want to be included in this number that's going to automatically generate. So keep track of that. Like if you think you're going to be doing thousands, put five numbers and anticipate 10,000s just to give yourself slack um, and, and do that. And I'm glad you mentioned the date thing because I myself have committed the date apocalypse that comes when you're dating like our typical like month, day, year. And then you're like, oh my gosh, like that was useless because it's not going to search right. So I'm so, so glad you mentioned that. So yeah. So, um, and and the, the reason they kind of try to set that international standard because is because I don't know how much you all are, you know, into British stuff, but my dad was British. And so the, the Brits kind of swap and they put you know, when we're, when we're writing out our date, we do month, day, year, the Brits do day, month, year, they swap those two numbers. So, you know, if you're looking at something like, like the way we date our um, letters, if I dated something 12, one, you know, 1980, then I know that's December 1st, 1980, but a Brit British person might read that as the 12th of January of 1980. Um, so that's why they try to set those inter international standards like that, because there are conventions from one country to another about the way um, you, you put those in order. So. Cool. Cool. So um, does, does anybody else have any, anything that that's, uh, that's, um, Brought up. Okay, so I'll go on to the next part. So this is now, um, and, and this is um, something that I kind of want everyone to go away and think about a little bit because it's kind of a concept at this point, but it is a concept that has emerged. Again, uh, some of you are going to recognize this conversation that we've had individually, uh, perhaps, um, because really this idea has emerged out of our conversations that I, I have with all of you. I, I listen and I remember, and these things go into this. So um, a, lot of, a lot of what this is, so I'm just gonna go to this slide, is, uh, is about acknowledging the reality of an organization and preparation session for metadata, right? Um, and so the origins of this proposal that I'm gonna make, which I think is a good best practice, but I would love it if you guys went away, contemplated this, thought about your own practices, and come back, say the next Platica with feedback on this, because we can all improve this and we can all make this better generally, like as a best practice and also individually and share tips on this, because right now it's kind of a proposal, although I have to say, I think it's a good one, um, but I'm biased. So um, the origin of this particular subject came out of wanting to acknowledge the reality that is, uh, okay, so just a little background. Organization and preparation being what you might do for with yourself, which is kind of easy because you're just dealing with your own materials and you know what you're doing and you're just dealing with your own self, right? Your own self and the needs and strictures of the archive. If as a community archivist, you're going out and you're gathering and working with other people to bring in their stuff, the question really came about, about what does an organization and prep session mean for that? And I wanna say right off, cause I think this is a really important thing and it's kind of a basis for this is the feedback and the thought about this is that if at all possible, and it may not always be possible, it's probably a good practice for everybody or, or a good practice generally to separate an organization and prep session from a digitization session. So if you have a scanner, if at all possible, it would be a good idea to do organization and prep with your subject and then scan separately, whether they let you take the photos away to do that or you do it on a different day. Organization and prep, which is so much of, it's most of the work, right? And some of you, many of you have heard me say this before. Digitization is no work at all, really. Organization and prep is everything. And it's really the main body and content of what you're doing as a community archivist while helping somebody get their stuff into the archive, right? And they have a different rhythm. And I think organization and prep will work better if its rhythm can be its thing without having to interrupt things to digitize and run the scanner and all that kind of stuff. So to get back to what I referred to earlier, you know, this organization and preparation is this. You're not worried about scanning. Part of what you're doing is creating your knowledge and understanding of this body of 
material so that you can do things like create a file naming structure, create an organizational structure. This also helps you create things that we won't talk about today necessarily, like you know, our other required fields, like a title, right? You're not gonna to wanna to make titles till you've seen everything that you're gonna be doing that because then you can make titles that make sense, right? And file names that make sense. So organization and prep sessions are all about that, right? And it's also about collecting the metadata, right? So I think that in some ways it's about acknowledging the reality that these sessions will have their own way and rhythm. And the other reality that's really come to the fore, which I think is really true, um, is that if say you're, and this will be the majority of our sessions probably is getting together with someone and going over their photos because you know we've all talked about low hanging fruit and uh, bite sized chunks and things and that the real initial focus of the of the archive is trying to get materials like that into the archive right. So really a metadata and prep session as we're conceiving it right now is you getting together with somebody and looking over their photos and what that really means. And I think we need to acknowledge the reality of what that really means is that that very notion of sitting down with someone and looking at pictures essentially turns into a storytelling session, right? And you don't want to, you want to embrace that storytelling session. You don't want to fight it, right? But what does that mean when you're also a community archivist needing to collect metadata that's useful to you and metadata that's gonna go into the archive and be the metadata that you're entering for each item about this, right? So in talking with some of you, I've mentioned things like having basically, you're running a control track in the back of your mind. You're having a conversation with an individual and you're bonding with them over the shared experience. But in your mind, you're also going like, remember all that metadata that you need to get for each of these items, right? Basic things, who's in it, where is it? all these things you want to know about these photos how do you how do you collect that metadata while still you know having a good connection and conversation with this person and now they're telling you all these stories as well so a lot of this is you managing and surfing this whole thing and making sure you need to get what you need out of it i.e. metadata while you're talking with them and this is the reality we're talking about so um, I've already mentioned, you know, uh, separating these sessions, you know, so, and so really what I'm talking about is that last thing, keep your eye on the metadata prize, right? No matter how your session goes from your own way that your experience that's going to be also governed by how you uh, work with people and your own personal skills, that you have to work this, keep your eye on the metadata prize into that. So to that end, there's been some contemplation about how that might work. And so, you know, one of the ideas is this, and let's see, if, does that make sense to go to the next slide? I don't remember. Let's see. Yeah. So one idea is this. One is to uh, record the session from the straight off go, right? And what you're doing this is you're doing this for yourself. And yes, you might be accidentally collecting all these stories that aren't metadata, and that's great too, but what it's really helping you do is as you are maybe keeping track and keeping notes and trying to actually get the answers from your subjects that you need, that you don't need to like be completely rigid or disruptive about it, right? You can, if you record it, it means you can go back later and fill in what you might not have written down because you were focusing on actually talking to the person. This helps you do that. And a uh, suggestion would be to be very transparent about it. Tell them why you're going to record the session and what you're going to do with it. And um, I think it's a good practice to, you know, get the permission and get a signed release form out of the way, but also make it clear that this recording will be confidential. It's basically a reference recording for you. And I would encourage the thought that is, if you want to do an oral history with this person, don't think of this recording as that oral history, although it sort of serves as an insurance policy of one right, but that it's really a reference thing for you and you don't want to turn what is a metadata organization and prep session into an oral history because that's going to make it harder for you to stay kind of on your own mission as regards to metadata, right? So don't fight it, but also you don't want to go totally sideways, right? So um, make it clear that the recording will be confidential and if you think it's going to help 
with making your subject comfortable, offer to delete the recording after you're done taking notes off of it or give it to them because maybe they want to have it. Maybe they like the idea of having a recording of the session. Like So this these notions of transparency and real clarity about how this recording is just, because really what you're going to encounter a lot, and you don't want to make people start to self-edit, although they inevitably do with recording, which is like, that they tell some really terrible, horrible story about one of their cousins that they would never want to see the light of day, but got triggered by one of these photos, you don't want them to feel like, yeah, that thing's going to get out there and cause them problems in their life or whatever. So offer to whatever, if they think that they're going to be, you know, spicy, then give them the freedom to be spicy and tell them that you'll delete the recording after you take notes. So I think that the recording thing will be very helpful to you, but it's very helpful to also have these very clear things with your subject of, as to what you're going to do as recording. So what this allows you to do then is very much concentrate on whatever might be your process for notating the metadata that's your real mission in doing this organization and prep with them. So as you talk about them and help them organize, you know, you're keeping track. And then as you go photo by photo to get metadata. So we've talked to a few of these. This is an evolving idea in the project itself. Estevan has been very much wanting to go after a sort of a digital way of collecting metadata using Google Forms, for example, or Jot Forms or something like that. So those, for those of you that are very tech handy and prefer the technological way of doing things, this might be an option. We will have an option for you that's like that, where you can just sit there and literally enter in metadata, boom, boom, field, 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 and it, it can be conducted that way, although there's some technical things on the back end of that that we have to get sorted, which is why we don't have that yet. And then for people that want to do this longhand and do that, you know, plan out paper forms, enough to do all the items and just write down the metadata as you're doing it. The, the main goal here is going to be to be adaptable to what everybody does and give them an options. Now, if you're going to do it longhand, you probably you realize you're going to have to do this, which is if bulk uploading becomes the thing we can do, you're going to have to transfer all that data into an active spreadsheet. So you may want to sit there with a spreadsheet, although that might not be a great way to do it, but you'll figure it out. You do whatever works best and works comfortable for you as this settles in, we will be very clear as to what these tools are and the options are, but you're going to want to get used to that's kind of what you're doing with yourself while your subject is doing this, is you're going to keep track of this metadata and as easily as possible, make sure you're going to be able to get this all into a spreadsheet or into, if you're wanting to do this manually for whatever reason, getting it into the metadata as it goes up to, to that. So, um, so you know, one thing is to make sure that whatever it is you do and whatever it is you're doing, that you are creating a comfortable and conducive condition for your session, a good environment. You want your subject to be very comfortable with you, confident about what you're going to do with their information and just everything. Have bottles of water for them, but they're going to be talking, whatever. Because really, yes, you are going to settle into the like, you're two people looking at some photos and talking about them. It's, it's going to be a looking at family photo session in the most basic and true sense. You just know you want the metadata. So you'll constantly return to questions that you're going to know, like or things like, oh, okay, so every picture. Oh, so who's in this photo, right? And make sure, double check. Don't assume that it's the same people in the last photo. Just you know, constantly stay keep things on track by remembering what you're there together in this particular session. I myself believe, although I have no reasons to believe this, because again, this is a theoretical thing, that if you explain to your subject that your methodology and what you're looking for, that they're going to actually really want to help you with this, right? And they're going to get it and they're going to do it. Brent, are you jumping in to say something? No? Okay. That was just a, a mic on thing. Okay. Um, is So, you know, it might end up being really easy for you. They're going to get it. They're going to understand what you want. And they're going to anticipate this and they're going to help you. So I actually anticipate that that's going to end up being what happens, right? Once they know the metadata you need, they're going to want to give that to you every time in every photo, and it'll become a very easy thing to do, right? An important thing to remember is to metadata each item separately. That's what you're going to have to do when this gets uploaded into the archive anyway. So you might as well do it from the start and make sure that each item is clearly metadata. Uh, for what and how you want to do for that. And I already mentioned the forms. 
we'll try to make sure, and this will be good feedback from you all, is what kind of forms you need, digital, paper, whatever, what is going to be the way that's going to help you more easily get this metadata during these sessions where maybe a lot kind of is going on, right? So the organization before you start looking at everything, I think will be helpful. And then kind of keeping track of all this while you're talking to them, I think is gonna be helpful. Um, and, oh, I guess I guess that's my whole, whole, whole thing on that. So again, that's kind of, a, so I'm gonna stop sharing screen so that I can see everybody again. Um, so, so yeah, a, any initial um, thoughts about that or feedback on this kind of idea that I'm sort of proposing for how an organization and prep session goes? Yeah, that's okay. I know it needs time to process and whatever. So if you guys just think about it as you go away and when we come back together, if you, and, and try it out, see if this is works or if you don't think this works and that my idea is completely insane and that's not what happens in the real world. Also, let me know that I'd be really good. I think it's really important that we start to help and help each other figure out how these sessions go, especially because, you know, we do want at the end of the day, we do want, we want as much, um, you know, stories and, and those important parts of this that people want to share with us in the archive as possible. So, so yeah, so any, any uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm a little, I'm a little confused, but um, yeah. when we're, I'm kind of backtracking when okay. we're digitizing and, and you say the numbers go in automatically, yeah. But then would we need, like when we're separating files, let's say I go to someone's house and they have family photos, but then they also have photos of the Santana event, but I want to separate those in two separate categories. But if I'm scanning them all, there, you know, there's 10 photos of one group and 10 photos of one group, but they're all like one through 10 and the other one starts from 11 to 20, but I want to start on one in the other file i mean do i just i don't know how that works so what i would recommend or, or do we okay yeah what Go i would, what i would recommend was somebody wanting to jump in there I, I wasn't sure did somebody have a response okay so I'll go and then you can go. So what I would recommend is it kind of exactly that, right? But before you even create the file names and before you start that for any given group, organize it, separate it all out. Okay, these are the family photos. These are that event or that group that they work with or whatever. And so now you can go, oh, well, I've got two separate file naming conventions I wanna use. Like in my example, right? There was the florist family one. Those are just family photos. Then there's my mutual lease of one. Now I have this other thing I'm including in that, in that file naming convention, right? And then when you scan them, mm -hmm. you can just scan them. So do all the family photos. They'll all get numbered one to 100. Then go in, reset your file naming convention in the scanner, right? You can do it like once you're done with those 25 photos that are the family photos and want to do the next 25 that are that event, go in, change the file naming convention and let the numbering start from scratch with that different file naming convention, right? So you don't have to do all the photos in one number sequence. You can separate them out and make them into these mini collections within the bigger collection, but you can acknowledge that collection in how you structure your naming convention. So MP, Manitos Project, right? The family name of what that is. And then, so now that's the second step now we know it's all of this person or a or person right so a first initial last name because it's their photos and then you have something after that, that distinguishes between family photos and these other photos so your collection will still kind of be together because the first parts connect but now you have a thing that differentiates this collection from that collection within their collection does that make sense Yes, and I kind of understand that, but I'm thinking more when I go to someone's house yeah. and let's say they have 10 photos, but mm -hmm. they're not all family photos and they don't want me to take the photos. I have to take my scanner and computer and do it at their house. Do I, you know, it'd be easier for me to just scan all the photos instead of resetting it for each one individually. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, so, so yeah, I totally get yeah, it. You know, so, 
Yeah. So I would say do that organization and prep, even if you're doing it all on one day and it's a long day and you're there, do an organization and prep session with them. So you know what you're scanning, organize that stuff and go through the organization and prep thing and then scan their photos. Right. So at, or at the least do the organization part. Right. If you're having to kind of hybridize all that and do it all together at once, at the very least, organize at the beginning so you know what order you're going to scan in because you still got to scan them all in order anyway, right? So try to organize them with them, right? And then create file naming conventions while you're going along and just stop at number 25 and go into the scanner and reset the file name and restart the numbering thing. So you'll have all the photos. You'll go away with your file with a hundred photos. It's just some of them will have, the first 25 will have this file name convention and number one of 25. The second amount will have a different file con convention named one through 25. And then the last 50 will have whatever. And you know, if it's a very varied thing where there is no thing, you just do one file name, the, you know, blah, blah, file name, blah, blah, blah. So if you have just a hundred random photos, that makes it really easy. Cause then, yeah, you just do one hundred cause you don't need to separate it out. This is just allows you to separate it out in the example you gave, right? There's family photos and here's this other thing, this organization they belong to. This allows you to separate those out without having to separate them out too far. They'll, they'll still retain the, the, in the thing, the record of the fact that they all come from this person. Yeah. Does that make sense? No. Did you freeze? I think you froze. Yeah. All right. All right. You're, you're going digitally audio into like another dimension. So I think we're losing you for a second if you can still hear us. So, oh, okay. So she's going to try to log back in, I think. So, um, I, I just have a little feedback. Um, I yeah. think in theory, uh -huh. this is totally right on. The mm -hmm. challenge is that it's not, uh, in my experience, both because of my schedule and then also other people's that like, you know, you can see why. <laughs> um, yeah. Here why. Um, <clears throat> like doing multiple sessions and stuff yeah. is sometimes tricky, <laughs> you know? And so, um, and also, when you're gathering, when you're trying to get the information, um, the story is just pouring out of them. And my experience is that it doesn't happen that way a second time. You know, like, like it's, yeah. maybe they will tell it again, but the first round is like the, just, just often like when you take your very first picture, sometimes it's the better one, even though you take 10 more, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And so it's a tricky one of trying to really hone in on the, on the metadata thing, but also be responsive to like this, the dynamics. I really only have one experience of, of this like kind of melding situation, you know, where we were trying to go through and figure out who were in these photos. And it was just so braided in with stories and things like that, you know, too. And yeah. maybe it could work to redo it but maybe not you know um so <clears throat> I, I totally I, hear i totally yeah, hear you on just, that that's that's a, a good point i mean ideally right and you have that relationship enough to where you can get their permission to use that recording for whatever reason right either it's just that's that's the oral history we're good we can save this recording or you go and edit out different like this perfect story right this now becomes what you want to do with it as a, as a, you know, uh, a kind of a creator and kind of way. So I think that's a really good point. You know, ideally I, cause I totally agree with you about that first picture, first shot thing. Right. Like I just want, it's a part to introduce an element where if they're not comfortable with it, that you have an option where you can go, I'm going to record this, but I'm going to get rid of it. But I think you're totally right. And I think that that's an, a good and okay thing to do. If you have that relationship, you know, that comfort and trust to go, I'm just going to record it. Please sign these releases and let me, you know, trust me to, to do right and good with this recording. And hopefully you do have that relationship where they will, yeah, yeah, do whatever you want with the recording. That's the ideal answer, right? So you have a signed release form, which is really important so that you don't have to go back and get that from them. To, so it, I agree. I think you've described an ideal situation. 
they sign the release form and you, you, they trust you with the recording and they trust that you're going to do good and right by it. And then you as a community archivist can make that decision or help them make that decision about how and what they want to do with that recording. So I think that's a good point. Another yeah. thing that has come up, not so much in relation to um, scanning is that it feels really ethical to give people the chance to hear it before it's, you know, so they get to actually, some people just say, no, I'm comfortable with what, you know, what was said and enough, I don't want to be bothered. But like, you know, either <clears throat> in an ideal world, even a transcript or something, but we aren't even to that point of quite doing transcripts yet, but just allowing them to hear it. And yes, there's been a couple of times where people said, you know, I want this part taken out or like bleep out the bad words here and here <laughs> you know, or whatever, you know, so um, just that way it doesn't mean that you have to throw the baby out with the bathwater because sometimes there's just some really wonderful things that are said and sometimes you just can't I mean people also die like that's the other thing and you don't get back to like it's just it's crazy you know but like you don't get back to recording them again and they're gone and it's it's heartbreaking you know so anyway just to, no no I I totally agree with you and I hear you like first session is almost always the best session. We just want them to, like you say, empower them to determine what happens there. And, and it's a thing, because like in some ways that recording is a byproduct of this very specific work that you're both there to do together regarding these photos. And we do, this is kind of a way to try to figure out how to capture the magic of that storytelling session and what to do with it. And I probably did, I overemphasized like, what to do to make sure that, you know, the recording of it's going to interfere with any other comfort aspect of it. But I think, you, I totally think you're right. Like, ideally, that recording is something you totally use. They, you have, they are comfortable enough that you have permission to do with it. And that it becomes more of that editing process, like you say, where they're like, take that story out. I told that. I'm not quite ready to have that one. Only, only let that story out after I'm dead. I, I've actually heard that before when doing sessions like this is like, well, you can record this part, but I don't want you to release this recording till I'm dead for five years. I'm like, okay, I wasn't going to release it anyway, but noted your recordings. I got to wait till you're dead five years. So like, I totally think that, like I and I think that that's the case and I think you know a good thing about your point is the fact that there's going to be a wide variety of things and the best thing we can do is figure out how to get tools and these procedures in place so that everybody has to, can adapt to whatever it is that every every session is going to be different for people's comfort level and what they want to have happen and what they can do and yeah, hopefully they're just like, do whatever you want with the recording. That's my favorite answer completely. So yeah, yeah. Um, cool, thank you, Claire. That's actually really excellent feedback. I appreciate the contribution of that. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts about this proposal of how to do these realistic recordings or these sessions that we know won't just be Fact, 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 fact are, are going to turn into something much more exciting and creative in some ways than that, or how to do that. So cool. All right. Well, I will. Uh, I will. Um... If I may. Oh yes, please do. Hi. Hello. Uh, this is Andres Aragon. Yeah. Um, uh, El Cerrito, uh, doing the project out in El Cerrito, New Mexico. Um, you know, I uh, I find also, and so I'm bringing to this the experience of a social worker. I find that the pre-engagement uh, is huge because it can allow the person, it can allow you to start the process of crafting a narrative. And so when I'm, when I'm in the process of, of setting up time to meet, uh, talking with the people that I've worked with thus far and whatnot, I'm, I'm, I'm actually encouraging them to build a narrative out of the things they're going to be giving me. So I, I've started this process long before I show up in, 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 the, in the work that I'm doing in terms of asking them, what, what story do you want to tell about your family and or, your, or, or El Cerrito or the other villages that are related that are coming in? Uh, how, how do we capture that in photographs? When you're looking at your, at your photograph, uh, uh, at your uh, collection, 
what photographs stand out to tell the story of your dad, of your grandma, your grandpa, whoever, whatever we're doing. And so really, I think in some respects, uh, I, I like to trust the power of the, of, the, of the storyteller to craft their own narrative and start that crafting process and to have time to think about it. Um, and that way, when I show up, they've already done some of this work and they've, they've allowed their own creativity, their own narrative uh, relating process to play out over the pictures that are laying in front of me uh, they, that, they, that they want to utilize to tell their narrative. And so that's how, that's how I've done it to this point is by starting there. Um, I get that out of social work and that when I'm asking people to bring documents to me, I'm, I'm asking them for a specific set of documents that are required by federal or state or whatever. But also along with that, I'm, I'm encouraging them to bring the stories that I need to know so I can understand how to better serve them in, what, in the cases that I'm serving. Well, all I'm doing is bending that and we're making this into the photographs that we have here. So that, that's, that's a way that I, that I do this process, that I work with this and it, it does well. The photographs that have been presented have been given, have at least in the, in the several folks that I've worked with have been given a clear narrative, a, a narrative arc, if anything. I, I have the ability then as the professional, quote unquote, to step in and start helping craft that narrative a little tighter, ask questions of what about this picture seems to be a, an outstanding document. Is it proper for now? Or do you think we should hold on to it for maybe another time if we pass through? Whatever the deal is. So I, I, it gives us the ability to allow people to tell their story and to help them craft. So I, I'd start that process prior to even showing up at their home, uh, giving them the power of narrative, giving them the power to have control over what comes our way rather than us looking at all these things and trying to organize it in the moment. And then it's our mind imprinting on their stuff. So that, that's, that's the two cents I have to offer. Wow, fantastic. Thank you, thank you Andres, actually. Thanks, for, thanks. Uh, and it reminds me that you know, I really hope that maybe next month or the month after, I really would like you to speak a lot more on the synthesis that you've been doing, because I feel like you've been uh, working a lot and, you know, realistically how some of these abstracts that I talk about have, have fit your particular methodology in your thing. So I'm actually looking forward to that. You, and, and what you just said reminds me that, that I hope that we can really get that to happen. So. So, so thanks, thank you um, for the insight into that, that part of the process and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, hey everybody, hey Shane, it's Brent. Hey Brent, how are you? Good, I just wanted to chime in and just say hello and just wanted to thank Andreas for that great piece of uh, just sharing that he gave. Um, I think one of the kind of more anxious parts I have with the project is just, you know, getting those connections going and then also making those experiences something meaningful for the community members that do want to share and not have it be just sort of this transactional situation. And so I just want to say thanks to Andreas. I think that was some great, um, you know, process sharing that you did. And, um, and I like, again, just, pro, you know, putting the power or leaving the power in the hands of the person telling the story and sharing and trying to sort of not insert yourself. I think that's some great advice for me personally, because I know that when I start to get into that kind of work mode, I can lose some of those like people skills that I naturally have. Um, and I was also just sitting here thinking like, you know, some of the people that I've contacted that I'm trying to set up some appointments with, you know, I just, in my mind, I started to think it's like a Sunday visit. You know, I know that growing up, we did a lot of Sunday visiting and it was always very sort of, you know, casual, but also you had to have respect and, and it was a lot of laughter and sharing. And, and so Andreas, as you were talking, that image came into my head as, as kind of this sort of image that I can carry with me when I start to interact with uh, community members and let them share and so that I can document. Um, so I just wanted to chime in guys, make sure uh, I said something today. And um, I hope everybody has a great night. Well, thank you, Brent. And I, I want to highlight just because it, actually it's a common theme. You, you pointed out that Andres said it, but it's even a factor um, in what Claire was talking about a lot too. And I am really glad to point it out because I think it's worth doing, which is 
I know that a lot of the approach to this in the mechanics of metadata, which is about making this archive work really well so that Benitos can see themselves is, is a mechanics thing. And it does end up sounding very transactional. And I really appreciate that you highlighted, and so did you, Andres and Claire, you know, in different words and kind of way, which is like, this can't be transactional. This has to be personal and has to have those elements of respect. And so I'm hoping as this kind of process evolves um, that, you know, to make sure that that's at the forefront, even though this mechanical thing also has to happen to make it work. And so like, ideally, hopefully it does get to be where it's, um, it's uh, collaborative or conspiratorial and people wanna help you get that data and become sort of, you know, a game or a pleasant diversion in that way. But I, I appreciate, and I'm glad that it's gonna be on here and in this recording and everything, this emphasis on it not being a transactional thing and remaining very much a, a human and a joyous thing. Um, so thank you. Thanks, thanks you, Brent, and thanks all three of you for, for really highlighting that particular reality in different ways. Yeah, so thank you. Um, yeah, um, does anyone else have uh, any thoughts or, insight at the moment in, in this. I know that more will probably come later, but for the moment, does anybody else have any thoughts on or on their own processes, how they've been working so far, you know, yourselves uh, that you just want to mention right now? Yeah. Nope. Okay. So that's good. I mean, we're pretty close to time anyway. So um, this has been a really great conversation. And I actually I'm so grateful for all the feedback because this is all going to help. This is all going to help make this better as we uh, figure out stuff. Um, I'm hoping that by the time that we have the next um, Platica, that we have an operational thing. We're actually, you know, getting close to dialing it in. I have homework where I have to sort of finalize, you know, all the information and feedback we've gotten to synthesize this final metadata thing. And we have people working on the build itself. So. I'm going to tentatively optimistically say that in two weeks, we will finally start to have the access to the to the archive and the training, which puts it between now and the next Platica and the next meetup. So, um, and feel free to email me feedback on this as well, which is we could flip the Platica and the metadata if that's helpful when that happens, or maybe we'll have a special, a, met, a metadata, a Platica special uh, to talk about the access to the tool, we'll, we'll figure it out. So, but feel free to tell me what you think about that um, and see, see how that goes. Um, at that same time, I also hope to be able to introduce you at whatever the first event is um, to this uh, new archivist that the project has and everything like that. So um, I will basically say thank you um, with much gratitude actually about this conversation. This has been very helpful. So. Um, so thank you to everyone. And thanks, Katie, for hanging out and, and always adding stuff that I totally didn't even think about or forgot about. So I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming, everybody. And we will see you in uh, probably a couple of weeks for either the meta, the meetup or the or, or the next Platica. So um, cool. Thank you. <laughs>